Diode laser engravers can make high quality engravings on a wide range of materials, and some more powerful diodes allow them to do light cutting. Many diode lasers do not come equipped with limit switches, which are required to home the machine. Some of Lightburn's most useful features depend on the laser being able to home. The Sculptfun S9 is a popular diode laser engraver that does not come with limit switches, and in this video, we're going to fix that. Timestamps will be in the description so that you can skip around as needed. Homing is when the machine goes to a known corner using limit switches so it knows where it is and can reset to a known repeatable position. Although in this video we're working with the Sculptfun S9, the process will be very similar for Atomstack, Totem S, and possibly additional diode engravers. This modification is not intended for beginners, and anytime you modify your machine, you run the risk of damaging it. We highly recommend watching the video from beginning to end to make sure you fully understand the process before considering this mod, and as always, proceed at your own risk. In this video, we will cover the physical installation of the limit switches, as well as how to get them configured with GRBL firmware. In a follow-up video, we'll take it a step further and cover the reflashing of the firmware for a more permanent solution. Let's run through the items needed to perform this upgrade. Links to each will be in the description of this video. You will of course need a Sculptfun S9 or similar style of diode laser with ports on the control board for limit switches. In addition, you will need two limit switches. We recommend the version that has three wires and a circuit board some M3 screws and M3 2020 T-nuts for mounting those switches, extension cables to reach the controller, as well as 2020 extrusion covers to keep everything tidy and protected. You'll also need 3mm acrylic or wood to cut out the limit switch spacers with your laser. Or, if you have a 3D printer, the STL file is linked below. We'll be using the provided Lightburn file to cut them out. First we need to mount the limit switches. The x-axis limit switch will be mounted on the far left side of the x-rail, and the y-axis limit switch will be mounted on the front left rail. That means the laser head will home to the front left corner. For the spacer, I'm going to cut it out of some fairly thin 3mm wood that I have laying around. The first thing we'll do is place our material in our work area and adjust the height of the laser head so that it has the correct focal distance. Be sure to place some scrap material underneath the wood that you're cutting so that the laser does not burn into your tabletop when it cuts through. With our material in place, we're ready to head over to Lightburn. We'll start by opening the project file. Depending on your material and your specific laser, you may need to slightly adjust, but for the S9, the provided settings should be sufficient. We will want to make sure that we're in line mode so that it cuts out the part, and as always, it is a good idea to verify everything is looking correct in the preview window. Everything looks great, so we can close out of the preview window. For the start from mode, you can use whichever method you feel comfortable with. I'm gonna be using the current position and centered to quickly and easily align the laser head on the material. If you have questions about the different start from modes, be sure to check out the video we released on them to get a better understanding of how they work. We will then run a quick square frame command to make sure the laser will be running the job in the correct location. When you're ready, hit start to run the job. Once complete, grab one of the limit switches and verify that everything aligns how it should. The pins on the underside of the board should fit in the openings in the spacer, and the two screw holes should also be aligned. If anything needs to be changed, it is fairly easy to modify the file within Lightburn. With the two spacers in hand, it is time to mount the limit switches to the frame. Before doing anything else, make sure your machine is powered off and unplugged. The first step is to install the T-nuts. Since the belt is running in the top of the channel, we need to put some downward force on the T-nut to get it seated. I found inserting a long M3 screw into the T-nut and turning it with one hand while using a small flathead in my other hand to work best. Once in place, take a shorter screw, for me an M3 by 8mm was perfect, and insert it through the hole in the center of the switch as well as the spacer. Thread that screw into the T-nut, making sure the switch is facing towards the head of the laser. We want to make sure the screw is tightened fully to prevent any movement of the limit switch. Next, we'll rinse and repeat this process to install the limit switch on the Y axis. With the switches in place, we're ready to remove the cover on the controller. To do this, remove the four screws on the back side of the housing that holds the cover in place. With the screws removed, we're able to lift the cover off. 
The laser's wire harness runs through a hole in that cover, so we'll just move it enough to gain access to the ports on the controller. Looking at the board from the front, there are five open ports running along the left side of the board. The two ports we're interested in are labeled X and Y. For the Y axis limit switch, we should have enough length on our cable to reach the board from its mounting location. However, the X axis limit switch will be moving back and forth and requires an extension to reach the board. Ideally, you would create your own wire harness and crimp the ends, but we wanted to make sure that this was as accessible to as many users as possible and we'll be using off the shelf extension cables. Taking the end of the X axis limit switch cable, we'll insert it into the extension cable. Direction does not matter, but you want to make sure it's fully seated. You will notice right away that the wire color and orientation for the limit switch and extension cables are different. This is not a problem, but you will need to trace each wire from the limit switch to the controller to make sure you plug it in the correct direction. Failing to do so runs the risk of causing damage to your laser's controller, so it is extremely important. Now we are ready to plug both cables into our board. The board uses a JST style plug, while these cables are using DuPont connectors. If you are able to swap the ends from DuPont to JST, it is recommended, but the DuPont connectors will work fine as long as they are securely installed. Next to the X and Y ports, you'll see the letters V, G, and S. The V is for voltage, G is for ground, and S is for signal. The limit switches we are using have red for voltage, black for ground, and green for signal. It is always a good idea to double check color and orientation of your limit switch. There are slits on both sides of the housing cover, which you can feed the cable through, or you can route the wires through the existing opening that the current wire harness goes through. For the X limit switch, I do want to warn one more time to not go based off of the colors on the extender cable and instead follow the wire all the way down. Once confirmed, you can plug both cables in and make sure that they are fully seated. I recommend giving them just a slight pull to ensure that they're making enough contact with the pins. Leave the front cover off until we verify that everything is working out as it should. Now we are ready to plug in the power cable, connect the laser to our computer with the USB cable, and power on the machine. Heading over to Lightburn, we want to check the console to make sure that we are connected to the laser. Once verified, we will enable homing with limit switches by entering $22 equals 1 into the console and hitting enter. On the S9, when I homed the first time, the laser did not home in the correct direction. To fix this, I entered $23 equals 3, which correctly homed the machine to the front left. Depending on your machine, you may need a different value for $23. There is a very simple table that you can reference based on the direction your machine is homing that will allow you to invert those directions. The link to this article will be available in the video description. Next, we will click the homing button in the laser window to home the laser. I highly recommend having your hand ready to kill the power in case the laser moves to the limit switch and does not stop. If that does happen, reseat your limit switches and double check the wiring on them. You should now have limit switches installed and functioning properly on your machine. The default speeds were way too slow, so I changed two additional values, which were $25 equals 8000 for the homing speed and $24 equals 100 for the speed between the laser hitting the limit switch and relocating it. The final changes we need to make in GRBL are a workspace offset. Homing the laser and clicking Get Position in the Move window will show you your home coordinates. In my case, they are negative, so I'll need to grab the displayed X and Y values. In the console, enter G10, L2, P1, X, and the negative value that was displayed, which for me was negative 409, and Y with the negative value that was displayed, and in my case that was negative 399, and hit enter to apply. We will also set the machine status reporting to be relative to the workspace origin by entering $10 equals zero. Normally, when you change these values in GRBL, it would save to EEPROM. However, the S9 and quite a few other machines have a poor implementation of the firmware. What this means is that every time you connect to your laser, it resets all of those settings to the factory defaults. The best and most permanent solution to resolve this is to flash a clean copy of GRBL to your controller. This is a bit more advanced and something we'll be covering in an optional follow-up to this guide. Another quicker solution, if you do not feel comfortable making changes in the firmware, is to simply create a macro within Lightburn. 
Heading over to the console window, you'll see a few buttons labeled Macro 0 through Macro 5. We will right click on Macro 0 to open the Edit Macro window. Inside of that window, we are going to place these six different commands that we sent. I will also change the name from Macro 0 to something easier to remember like Limit Switches. With the stock firmware, the laser will still forget our changes each time we connect, but instead of having to retype those commands every time we want to use the machine, we can simply click on that button to have it update those six values. The final step for this video is to reinstall the four screws on the housing cover and to make sure the limit switch wires are routed neatly. You can get some fairly inexpensive 2020 extrusion covers from Amazon, which can then be cut down to size. These do a great job of hiding the wires and ensuring that they do not fall out or get pinched. Stay tuned for part two of this video, where we'll cover what the process is like of flashing clean GRBL to the board and updating all of the values on our machine. This will be a permanent solution, unlike the macros, and the changes made will be able to save to EEPROM. Be sure to subscribe to our channel for more great videos and check out our existing playlist for additional guides on mastering Lightburn.